Welcome to Unearthly Upstate. I am Mari. And I am Matthew. And today we are going to talk uh, about a major historic event that happened in Buffalo, New York in 1901. And you can see one artifact from this event, but not mm -hmm. the real artifact. <laughs> no, it is a replica. It is a replica. Mm -hmm. And what we are talking about is the gun that was used to kill President McKinley. Mm -hmm. and this gun is on display at the Buffalo His History Museum. Now, majority of the time, it is a replica of the gun that was mm -hmm. used to kill President right. McKinley because they don't have uh, the proper display cases to right. ensure that the gun would be protected at all times. They bring it out. They bring the real one out every so often. But mm -hmm. it is there. It is at the museum. It's just when you go there, you see the replica. But only for special occasions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like on the anniversary of the event. Right. Of, of the assassination. And uh, mm -hmm. we're going to just talk about the gun a little bit. Uh, but we're also going to be talking about the assassination attempt. And there are three major players in the assassination attempt. Of course, there's the President Kinley. Mm -hmm. His assassin. Uh, let me make Leon sure. Chogos. Chogos, yes. And a man named Big Jim Parker. And you may have heard of the assassin, and you may have heard of the president, but how many have heard of Jim Parker? Oh, yeah. And okay. we'll discuss all of them and go into a little detail about the gun as well, because that's what you know, prompted right. this uh, podcast. Well, uh, I did some research on Leon Chogos. Mm -hmm. And, wow, uh, what a jerk. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll get into some of the, the stuff. Yeah, I had to think about that, remembering we were probably on the family hour somewhere, <laughs> uh, and and we're all, we already got an explicit because assassination right, is in right. the title, so let's not push it. But on September sixth, nineteen oh one. Leon Chogos killed President McKinley, apparently, to advance anarchism. Yeah. Uh, well, we're he didn't kill him that day, though. Yeah, we're, yeah that's right. He yeah. died later on. But we're not going to give the misguided motivations of Chogos any press on this pod. Okay, so suffice to say, Chogos was executed by electric chair at Auburn Prison in New York. Here we go again. Well, you... and it, yeah, on October 29th, 1901. Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll go into, like I said, we're going to go into these guys and go into all of them big detail. So, a little bit of background. Well, we've got to talk about McKinley. Now, McKinley was elected twice, first in uh, 1896 and then again in 1900. He inherited the mess from the Panic of 1893, which was an economic depression that lasted until 1897. So, he inherited it, but it got better. But it was yeah. very far-reaching. The effects of this depression was very far-reaching. Uh, McKinley, even though there have been two previous assassination, successful assassination attempts on other presidents, Lincoln being one, he really didn't like to have uh, guards around mm -hmm. him. He felt that interfered with him meeting the public. Uh, he didn't like being separated from the public. I don't know if it was ego or he just was really a people person and why he didn't like having guards around. Uh, there is accounts of him in, when he was uh -huh. in his hometown of Canton, Ohio. He'd be walking around with no guards. He'd go down to the businesses, you know. Well, didn't he sort of shun his Secret Service coverage? Oh, yeah, he did. To yeah, we, we demonstrate that he was. Uh, yeah, there's some a great kind of example. Great example leading up to his assassination and how he did this. <laughs> got to establish that. You got to establish his attitude towards his own protection. Yes. Now, Chogos uh, was born in Alpena, Michigan on May 5th, 1873. Uh, when he was 17, he found employment at the Cleveland Rolling Mill Company. And during 1893, when that uh, de economic depression happened, the factory closed. And then when they reopened, they were discussing uh, reducing wages, which led everybody to strike. So that was his first uh, first soiree into, I guess, socialism, because mm -hmm. it was the socialists mm -hmm. that really were pushing the striking at that point. And he joined a moderate club first, was the Knights of the Golden Eagle, but he found them too 
polite, I guess, and too moderate. (laughs) Too rational. Too rational. So then he went and joined the Sila Club. But even then he found those guys, again, not to his liking. They weren't extreme enough. Mm -hmm. And he becomes interested in anarchism at this time. I don't know if we should go into the full political and sociological uh, description of what anarchism is. Let's, uh, <laughs> that, that's homework for the listeners. Yes, please. Yeah, it will take too long to explain. But it's it's more uh, than just, quiz on uh, Friday. it's more than just dressing up as a punk rocker and screaming F authority. Okay. There's a little more to it than that, but. Well, he was, um, had personality problems. Oh, he did, yes. To begin with. Yeah. Well, yeah, because... He was really... He was kind of stupid. He was, and but there's so much here. Mass shooters, he assassins... He didn't say that a presidential assassin is stupid. Well, no, but if you if you look at modern mass shooters and you look at uh, modern assassins, mm-hmm. you're going to see a lot that are just red flags throughout his life. Mm-hmm. And one of the red flags, yes, that was our producer, Percy, uh, was that... When the assassination happened of King Umberto in Italy, he kept a scrapbook mm-hmm. about that assassination. He was obsessed over it. So, and you hear that a lot with, with people that do mass shootings and that they become obsessed with other acts of violence that they oh, want well, to, yeah, you, know, you know, want to well, intimidate. Assassins, you, you, bombers of all sorts, you know, they got yeah. their manifestos. Yep. Rubbish. So, so in 1908, he moves back with his father, who had a farm, but he didn't do anything around the farm. He just kind of stuck to himself. It was blamed that he had a respiratory disease, so that's why he couldn't do anything. But yet, it sounded like his his folks were not too happy he moved back and didn't help him out. So yeah. when he, he goes to Cleveland, Ohio, and he meets Emma Goldman, who at first is polite to him. Now, she was a, a speaker. She was an anarchist speaker. Okay. But, and she introduces him to other anarchists in Ohio, but then he starts to stalk her. Oh, nice. Uh, of course, the term stalking was used at that point, but he well, was... harassment. He was following her around a lot. Mm-hmm. So, um, here's the thing, though. He was known as Chagos. Chagos. Chagos at that time. He used the name Fred Neiman. At that time. An alias. He used an alias. And she finally, at first she kind of defended him. But then as he started stalking her, Mm -hmm. she became more concerned. Then Emma Schilling, I'm sorry, Emile Schilling, this is from the Wikipedia, had the radical Free Society newspaper issue this warning of a shy goss. This was on September 1st. Mm -hmm. Attention. It, the attention of the comrades is called to another spy. He's well-dressed of medium height, rather narrow shoulders, blonde and about 25 years of age. Up to the present, he has made his appearance in Chicago and Cleveland. In the former place, he remained but a short time. While in Cleveland, he disappeared when the comrades had confirmed themselves of his identity and were on the point of exposing him. His demeanor is of the unusual sort, pretended to be greatly interested in the cause, asking for names of solicitating aids for acts of contemplated violence. If this same individual makes his appearance elsewhere, the comrades are warned in advance and act accordingly. So That's right, comrades! <laughs> APB! So, <laughs> be on the lookout! For this weirdo. Well, in a pack of weirdos, how do you pick up one in particular? But as I get you, the anarchist didn't want him. <laughs> Okay. Now, why was he? Why was he in Ohio? Remember Canton, Ohio? Oh, yeah, I mentioned that earlier right. with McKinley. Uh-huh. William Ernst, he was a worker at a park in Canton, Ohio. Mm-hmm. Uh, stated he saw a man that resembled Shy in 1901. Now, the president was often going to this park because it was near his home in Canton. And the man had two guns. When Armitz reminded him that the firemen, the firearms were not permitted outside the shooting range, the guy ignored him, but left. Hmm. And Arnett did go get to the police, but they couldn't find him. Now, it wasn't verified that was Shagloss, but it's kind of damning, too, you know? Yeah, exactly. Well, we're establishing a pattern of behavior right. uh, for the assassin. And it doesn't look good. And sometime after that, he in 1901 as well, he moves to Buffalo. 
And on September 3rd, he makes up his mind to kill a great ruler. And he goes to Walbridge Hardware Store in Buffalo's Main Street and purchases a 32 caliber Ivor Johnson revolver. Yeah. We'll get back to the gun, but I think we've got to cover with, a little bit of... Uh, with 50 bucks of delusions of grandeur. Yeah. <laughs> but now we're going to cover the third person in this interesting act, right. and that's James Benjamin Parker, otherwise known as Big Jim Parker. He was born to slaves in Atlanta, Georgia, on July 31st, 1857. Uh, he did work a variety of jobs. He was a newspaper salesman. He was a constable. He was a waiter in Chicago. And then he moves back to Atlanta, becomes a waiter. He moves to Saratoga, and he finally ends up in uh, Saratoga, New York, and he finally en ends up in Buffalo. And he was working at the catering company that was working at the Pan American Exposition restaurant, but he gets laid off. And he decides to make, you know, lemonade out of lemons and decides to see the president. So we've got a quick oh, overview, okay. James. Now, we should probably discuss this gun because there's a... there's. 32 caliber, a five round, round. Yep. A breakaway chamber. That means it has a hinge on the frame. Mm -hmm. That allows you to sort of unlock it and open it up so that you can uh, unload the spent cartridges and, and put new. And it's a tiny gun. And it's, yeah, it's perfect. And it yeah. comes in a hammerless version. But mm -hmm. don't let the name fool you, it does have a hammer. Yeah. But it's just protected by the plates on the frame. Right. So it makes, it makes it perfect for a bicycle policeman. Mm -hmm. It was also known as a, that. And it was also the, well, the perfect assassination yeah, because tool, it, I guess. For, I saw a picture of it where they put like a, a, everywhere. the old Nokia flip phone next to it. Mm -hmm. And the Nokia flip phone was open. Mm -hmm. The gun was about the size of the flip phone. <laughs> yeah. It's tiny. Uh, the interesting fact, too, is... But a close range of thirty-two caliber. Yeah. Know, it's similar... I'm not sure if it's the same make and model, but another, I, uh, what was it? What's the name of the gun again? Ivor? Something like that. Ivor Johnson revolver Ivor Johnson was also revolver. used to kill Robert Kennedy okay. as well. Fun fact. Yeah, fun, fun fact. Where's the woman in the, where's that woman in the polka dot dress anyway? <laughs> All right, so now we have to build up to the actual assassination. So, now his president, to the, the secretary's president, George B. Cortelou, was mm -hmm. terrified an assassination attempt would occur. And he kept canceling this visit to the Temple of Music because he didn't think it could be secured enough. And McKinley kept putting it back on the schedule. So even his secretary was already going, this is, there's too many people here. We can't keep you safe. Mm -hmm. I think he even tries to convince him that, you know, McKinley, your wife won't like it there or something. Like, But McKinley kept going, oh, God, no, we're going to do it. with personal reasons yep. for not going. <laughs> so September 4th, McKinley comes to the Pan American uh, mm -hmm. Exposition. It, and uh, this is kind of like a World Fair type thing. It's a, you know, big event where everybody's showing off their stuff, you know. Right. So he comes in on September 4th on tra on a train, and there was a cannon sitting next to the tracks that was going to fire off when he got there and to, you know, give him a salute. And they had it too close. People thought it was a bomb. Yeah, they had it too close to the station, <laughs> and it destroyed, just the repercussion destroyed the, the windows. The shot. Yeah. This would be a full uh, shot. Yeah, this would be a full round. Right. A service round. Not like the kind of rounds we would use uh, when reenacting at Fort Stanwix. And instance. even those have enough and, repercussion. Oh, yes. You know, yeah. yeah. When you're touching it off with a lens stock, you certainly hear, feel the con uh, concussive force right, of right. the shot. And it's only like a, uh, maybe a quarter, yeah. if that. It's just enough to make a loud boom. <laughs> now, there, wouldn't have been, <laughs> there shouldn't have been anything else in the this, barrel. Because uh -huh. of the way you, you shot him off at Fort Stanwix. Yeah. It was just the, the gunpowder. Yeah, fired off a blank. A yeah. service round on the blank. Yeah. Just ran the pick. So it wasn't like they shot off a shell and that caused the explosion. It was the, the, it was the repercussion from the gun, yeah. uh, from the barrel of the mm -hmm. cannon, yes. So what Shigloss was in the crowd at that time, but he couldn't get close enough to the president. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, how fortuitous that would have been. Yeah. Being able to, to shoot in the moment that the... The cannon goes off. So well, that would show too much uh, forward thinking right. for Chodos, though, I think. 
Now, uh, again, they're trying. His secretary is trying to stop him from having the meeting greet at the Temple of Music in a few days. <laughs> yeah. uh, McKinley still refuses to cancel it, so his secretary starts calling for more security. Right. September fifth, the gates opened at six a.m. and five, fifty thousand people filled the space near the Triumphal Bridge to see the president. Shigos got close enough to the podium, but didn't fire because he couldn't make a clean shot. So apparently he only wanted to get the president, nobody else, okay? So McKinley then uh, tours the rest of the pavilions and even has a, a lunch, which was invitation only at the New York State building there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Shigloss was following the president the entire time, but there were so many people up against the president and the guards and everything, he finally leaves in frustration because he can't get close enough to the president. Mm-hmm. On September 6th, before the president was supposed to appear again at the exposition, uh, he slips away from his guards. More fool him. And they realize that they have to go chasing after the president. <laughs> so it's just... That's almost comical. I mean, it is. I mean... How adolescent. Yeah, but at the same time, it's almost comical. So, it is. Okay. So Shigos goes back to the exposition, and he gets there just in time to see the president leave to go to Niagara Falls. Because he's got a, a day of stuff to do in Angle Falls. Uh, they don't go into Canada because it would have been an incident, I guess. <laughs> that was right. Maybe what they're joking. Mm-hmm. But while they're at the falls, the president's wife falls ill due to the heat, and she goes back to the International Hotel while McKinley does the rest of his stuff. <laughs> and what did you have to say about this, Producer Percy? Producer Percival has yes. entered the studio. Anyway, he completes the tour of Niagara Falls and the hydroelectric plant, mm-hmm. and he returns to the exposition. His wife goes to where they were staying, which was called the Milburn House, Milburn House in mm-hmm. Buffalo. Okay. Now, the security arrangements at the Temple of, Mu- Temple of Music were pretty... They, they were trying to cover everything. The exposition police were, ske- uh, were stationed at the doors. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had detectives from the Buffalo police guarding this aisle. And basically the setup was the people were going to walk into this building up up this big aisle, shake the president's hand, and then ex- exit out the side to the next building. So they had guards at the one end, the Buffalo police officers. Now they had a Secret Service officer, George Foster, and two of the agents. They were assigned specially because of the secretary's concern at this point. Mm-hmm. Louis Babcock, who was the Grand Marshal of the Exposition, really wanted more security because somebody made a joke that the president might be shot at the reception. Oh, dear. So <laughs> he asked for a dozen artillerymen to attend in full dress. Okay. Originally, they were going to use them as decoration, but then he asked them to close in on any suspicious-looking person might approach the president. Now, these men were artillerymen. They were not trained police officers. They were not trained security Okay. And, and they just ended up pretty much mm-hmm. crowding the area in front of the president and obstructing the views from the detectives, from the Secret Service men, and mm-hmm. the, and the uh, Buffalo police officers. So the tent was there, but it it didn't help. Well, you had you people, uh, you, <laughs> you had yeah. soldiers who had no training in policing. Right. Yes. And they were, they were up front right next to the president. Mm-hmm. Uh, the public was expected to approach the president with open and empty hands, so in other words, they had to show they had nothing in their hands before they went up there. But it was so hot, and people were sweating so badly that a lot of them were taking out handkerchiefs and wiping their hands. Mm-hmm. So even though they were expected to go up there with open hands, mm-hmm. they were letting it slide because it was so hot. Right. Uh, the last uh, instructions that were given is anybody in any of the security details saw something in um, unusual or suspicious, they would raise their hands and all the doors would be barred immediately. Right. Okay. Yeah, you got it. So this is all set up, right? The doors are open, the public streams in, and there's a cute little story. A couple of little uh, cute little story happens pretty much at the beginning. A 12-year-old girl named Myrtle Ledger from Springbrook, New York, she asked President McKinley for the red carnation he wore and he gave it to her. So it's kind of a sweet story there. The Secret Service did trail a man who came in. He was asking very nervous. He was tall. A swarthy man. A swarthy man, yes. But he shook hands, McKinley, and left. So they were like, oh, okay. 
like I said, they weren't really enforcing that open hand rule, the open empty hand, and that's kind of how Shigloss gets away. He approaches the president with his hand wrapped in a handkerchief, and we told you how small that gun is. Mm -hmm. He had the gun in the handkerchief in his hand. Now McKinley reaches over to shake his his Shigloss empty hand, which is his left hand, and that Shigloss takes that time to shoot McKinley twice in the abdomen. He Oof. goes for a third shot, and the man behind him, James hey. Parker, Big Jim, Big Jim, tackles him, and then strikes the man, going for the gun. Soon as Shigloss is on the ground, the Buffalo Detective John Gary and one of the artillerymen, Francis O'Brien, they jump on him. Okay, and it's basically he becomes under a dog pile. At that point, he's getting rifle butted, he's getting kicked, he's getting punched. He's, you know, if anyone saw The Boys, just <laughs> season two, the what happened to Stormfront, multiply that with like six people, you know, six or seven more people on top of her, you know. But yeah, probably saying derogatory things. <laughs> okay. With Big Jim sitting on you. Yeah, and Big Jim's right in the middle of it too, okay. McKinley collapses, and but he's grabbed by people who are also on the podium, so he doesn't fall right away. He tries to convince everyone he's not hurt, but he's bleeding profusely. And McKinley's wow. saying, I'm not, I'm not hurt, I'm not hurt. When he sees them beating up Shigloss, he orders them to stop beating him up. Right. So, he, Shigloss is dragged away. He's searched by Agent Foster. They, you know, of course, they find the gun. And Shigloss keeps turning and watching President, the President McKinley, probably to try to watch him die. Mm -hmm. And Foster cold clocks him, just knocks him <laughs> out. <laughs> Meanwhile, the crowd's trying to leave. Now, remember, they were coming in one way and exiting out the other. Well, they turned around to try to leave, but you had the crowd trying to get in to see the President, not knowing what happened. So you end up with this mass of people who can't move. Yeah, that didn't work. McKinley was able to he was carried on a stretcher and taken by an electric power ambulance. I thought that was an interesting um, bit of trivia there. And they take him to the Ferris Hospital. Now, the Ferris Hospital, have you ever been to any big events? They always yeah. have like a first aid tent. Yeah, this was pretty much it. Oh <laughs> it was like a first aid tent, but they did have an operating well, what theater. What is the first thing that the first response responders yeah. do when they're administering first aid? Yeah. Do they... Uh, well, they would just treat his wounds and then try to stabilize him later Yeah, that's on. probably get, why... Get him into the triage area. For that's why they took him there to try to stay, you know, triage him right, right there. Exactly. Uh, but there was an operating theater attached. Even though it was basically a glorified first aid kit, it did have an operating theater attached to it. But there was no surgeon. Was that for the fair? For the fair, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. There was no surgeon on duty at that time because that surgeon was up near Niagara performing a surgery on a woman's neck. So there was no attending surgeon right then. Of course. Uh, on the way to the Ferris Hospital, McKinley is feeling around in his clothing, and he finds one of the bullets. Uh, it turns out one had deflected off a button on his clothes, and the other had entered his abdomen. So this was probably the one that got deflected, he found. So at 425, he reaches the hospital. The best surgeon in the city... Dr. Roswell, who I mentioned, was up in Niagara Falls performing a neck operation. When they asked him to stop the operation and leave, he said he wouldn't even leave for the President of the United States, at which point they said, uh, funny you should say that. <laughs> it's the President who's been shot. The first physician to arrive was Dr. Herman Minter, and it's quoted at this point, McKinley, when he was, you know, still trying to talk and be, you know, I don't think, I think he was in shock and didn't realize just how severe he'd been injured. Having been severely and suddenly injured myself, yeah, yeah there, there is, uh, well, you know, that, that period of shock. Yeah, so he's in shock, but he says to Shigloss, he didn't know poor fellow what he was doing. He couldn't have known. Mm -hmm. That was a quote that he said on the line. Now, Dr. Matthew Mann, who was a gynecologist and never had any experience with abdomen wounds, arrives, and but does say we need to operate him once. So at least... Okay, yes, he was a, a he wasn't his forte, but he recognized they had to well, operate his immediately. Speciality. Right. But okay, so we gotta give Dr. Mann that he realized the you know they had to be done. Minter 
the first physician was there had given McKinley an injection of morphine and strychnine to ease the pain. Is that really strychnine, or am I reading the wrong thing? I think that's think, strychnine. Strychnine. I think strychnine would cause pain, wouldn't it? Oh, <laughs> wow! It's poison. Oh, but then man goes. Man offer gives him ether, so he's knocked out. Right? Man literally digs around in oh. McKinley's abdomen. Can't find the bullet, so he just sews up the exit and enters room and says, okay, good. Now, someone offers at this time, There's hey, there's this new thing called the x-ray machine. We got one down here at one of the pavilions. Let's bring it over to use it. And the doctor's like, no, it, it, it would disrupt the patient. Let's not bother with that. Oh, boy. Well, you know, I'm just going to come out and say it. There's yeah. no safe dose of radiation. Yeah. But, you know, even an x-ray machine of its type, uh, yeah. 1901? 1901. Yeah, it would be pretty primitive. It would be, but... And they'd, he'd pro they'd probably give him a, a lethal dose. Oh, I wouldn't be worried about the radiation it. that too much as they couldn't find the bullet. Yeah. And even at the primitive stage, this x-ray was, they could have found the bullet. But they, they didn't want to disrupt the patient, so they right. said no. Dr. Park finally arrives, but he figures, okay, everything's well hand, I'm not going to interfere. At 5.20, McKinley was given more painkillers and then taken to the Millbourne House to recover so he could uh. be with his wife. Now, of course, downtown, where the police department is, there are crowds surrounding the police department. They want Shigos. They want him. And he's bragging while he's in there. He's bragging how he's an anarchist and how he's bringing down, you know, this great man. He was bringing down the United States. Well, when he admitted he was an anarchist, and, of course, that news makes goes through the telegraph and telephone wires pretty fast. Unfortunately, it led to the death of a man in Pittsburgh who was a known anarchist. He was lynched. Wow. Yeah. So I think the anarchists, the group, the people who were in the groups of anarchists, mm -hmm. could sense Shigos would be a danger to him, and he was. They ended mm -hmm. up getting punished for this man, yeah. for Shigos. So... Mm -hmm. I just want people to recognize that the organized groups of, which sounds weird, organized groups of anarchists. That's the problem with anarchism. You never yeah. expect people to take you at your word. Right. Now, what about Big Big Ben? What about J Big Jim? Yeah, what about Big Jim? Well, he is immediately claimed a hero by people there <laughs> who saw it. Right. They are swarming him. They're asking him for autographs. They are paying him for pieces of his clothing. Some guy was offering him a dollar for each of his buttons on his shirt. <laughs> they are shaking his hands. He is given a hero's welcome there. Okay. Lovely. People are, they are like, this man helped save Instant McKinley. Instant celebrity. Instant celebrity, right? Absolutely. So on September 7th, uh, his uh, at the Milburn house, uh, McKinley's wife is finally allowed to see him. And at this time, President, uh, Vice President Roosevelt is hurrying from his vacation in Vermont to Buffalo. September 9th, President McKinley seems better, so Roosevelt decides to go back, but he goes back to the Anirondacks, okay? okay? And he was a little upset because New York State law for attempted murder, which is what they think Shagos would be uh, mm -hmm. at this point officially charged with, would only give him a maximum penalty of 10 years. And Roosevelt was very upset at that because he didn't think that was long enough. At this point, it is attempted murder. Okay. Now, Attorney General uh, Filander Knox went to Washington uh, trying to figure a way how they could charge him under federal law. <laughs> okay. At this time. Now, September 10th, Secretary of uh, State John Hay, who had actually been around when the two previous presidents had been assassinated. He had been sec Lincoln's secretary and been a friend of James Garfield. Okay, so he personally witnessed two other presidents die. When he was met at the station by Babcock, who I mentioned earlier, uh, who told him how the assassination attempt to happened, mm -hmm. Hay, Hay said, oh, the president's going to die. Of course, oh, no. Oh, by the way. Yeah, I think you should listen to this dude. Yeah. <laughs> John Hay, I mean, he'd witnessed two assassinations of close friends of his. Uh -huh. You know, yeah, he called. He had the premonition. 
That day, too, Edison sends another x-ray machine, and the doctors refuse to use it. This time, making Twice. the excuse that McKinley was too obese for them to get a good reading. They don't even try. Well, that's not true. They don't even try. That, that, that was their they excuse. They don't even understand how x-ray works. Exactly. Well, that's how new it was. So, now, Jim Parker was interviewed at this time, and he said, I happened to be in a position where I could aid the capture of the man. I do not think that the American people would like me to make capital of the unfortunate circumstances. I am no freak anyway. I do not want to be exhibited in all kinds of shows. I am glad I was able to be of service to this country. Lovely. Yeah. So there, a lovely statement from Big Jim. The next day, President McKinley is giving nutritive enemas. Someone explain to me how that works. And then finally was allowed to have broth. Now, as somebody who's had stomach surgery, two, <laughs> the clear liquid stage is the stage in which your stomach is healing. Um, and it usually lasts a week to two weeks, depending, depending on your uh, surgery. I mean, yeah. my one, I think, was two weeks for both of mine. No. Okay. Two weeks for the first, and I think it was three weeks for the second one. You are basically broth. You you can only, and believe me, you don't want to have anything heavier in your stomach while it's healing. After my surgery for the appendicitis, yeah. uh, well, for the burst appendix mm -hmm. that they found. Yeah, for the, the first week or so, it was nothing but liquid diet. Right. Because I couldn't have anything in there. But the mm -hmm. next day on September 12th, they give him solid food. Oh, you're, you're healed up enough oh, here. Oh, no. Solid food. That's going to go septic. Oh, he starts complaining of stomach pains, and they're like, oh, you just have gas. So they give him laxatives. Oh, my God. Again, from some, I can really relate to Kennedy, uh, McKinley at this time. I've had that situation, too, where I'm like, no, I'm having pains. I'm having pains. Oh, it's just gas. It's not gas. And then they open me up and realize, oh, my God, you're right. Mm -hmm. you had, you know, there was something else going on there. So I know how hard... I. I can mm -hmm. see how it is mixed diagnosed. Now, in my case... Oh, yeah. The surgeon was like, what the heck? Yeah. In my case, they knew, they could see the ulcer, thanks to mm -hmm. the ultrasound, but they didn't see the the rip in my intestine. And you see, they... Yeah. Well, we can't get... We can't too go technical. And, and too technical. Yeah. yeah there are yeah, but, details we can't discuss. But I, you know, my surgeon was good, and he, mm -hmm. he had me scheduled for surgery... They just didn't realize there was other things going around because once they saw the, the ulcer and where the other thing was, they were pretty close to each other. <laughs> yeah. This mm. was with modern things, yes. it was. I won't say I was mixed diagnosed. I would just say I was... I can see how, with the information they were given, they didn't see the full picture. And being gut shot, come on. And, and then poor yeah, McKinley yeah. here, they don't x-ray him, even though, yes, those were primitive x-rays. Yeah. Abdomen shots yeah. would kill you. Well, no, what? Almost how, guaranteed how did at this you time. say that they handled his surgery? He literally poked around in there, looking for... Well, he the uh, shot would have broken through his intestines. They had to operate and repair the damage. And all intestines. the guy did was just close up the exit and entrance holes. He didn't do anything else. He just looked around for the bullet and left the rest of the damage there. Well, that's just stupid. And when you, we get to the autopsy, you're going to find out how bad was it was. It was, you know, the, it was the treatment he gave. It right. was given afterward that killed him. I know. But my point is, I can really relate. And like I said, my surgeon was good. I have no ill, ill feelings against my surgeon. He did what he did with the information he was given. But even nowadays, it's easy to not see the full picture. Mm -hmm. Back then, my God. But I can't, still can't believe they give him broth for one day and then say, "Oh, here's some toast and here's some solid food." My God, I would have refused it. Here's okay. a 72-ounce steak. Yeah. There is no way my stomach would have handled it at that point, you know? And I'm, I'm relating. Oh. That, that food would have been seeping. In. The digested, <sighs> partly digested food would be seeping into his abdomen. Oh, God. You know, I'm just... Becoming septic. I, I, I'm getting, getting sympathetic it. stomach uh, pains thinking yuck. of this right now. Oh, no, it's just terrible. <laughs> <You know? laughs> also on September 12th, on that day in Atlanta, where Big Jim was from... There was a mass meeting of 5,000 African-Americans where Booker T. Washington delivered an address 
denounced the deed of the red-handed anarchist and rejoiced that a southern Negro had saved President McKinley. No doubt. Well He's done, still being Bidger. praised. Oh, yeah. still, the next day, though, oh boy. September 13, McKinley collapses. Roosevelt is sent for, but he is up in the Adirondacks. He's up in his family's camp. Bully. And he is 12 miles away from the nearest telephone or telegraph, so a ranger is sent out to his camp to get him. Hmm. Doctors still don't know what is causing the problem with McKinley. All they know is he's fading fast. So they bring his, uh, he asks for his wife to be near him. She stays for most of the time then. She just finally leaves later in the night. Now, Dr. James Quackenbush, an attorney, in a newspaper article that day. Now, remember I said yesterday, hey, Jim, Big Jim was still being praised. Now, Mr. James Quackenbush, Bush, September 13th, states in a newspaper article, he was standing six feet away from the president. He saw Mr. Gallagher, Mr. Ireland, Ireland who were the Secret Servicemen, Private O'Brien, and the other men of the artillery lunge forward. He never mentions Big Jim. Well, with a name like Quacken Bush, yeah, he sounds a bit of a spiv already. The Secret Service first report states Parker struck the assassin in the neck with one hand, and with the other reached for the revolver, which had been discharged, the handkerchief, and the shots had set fire to linen. While on the floor, Shigloss again tried to discharge the revolver, the revolver, but he, but before he got to the president, the Negro knocked it out of his hands. That's what the Secret Service say on that date. They mention Parker by name. Just remember that. Mm -hmm. On September 14th, President McKinley dies. And by the uh, time Roosevelt makes it to the train station, oh, his midnight ride, Roosevelt's midnight ride, I don't know if we covered this before, just as an aside, we it was pretty it. intense. Yeah. Well, I think we did in that one. Oh, I think we had. We that, have, yeah. He rode down in that, mm -hmm. basically that gut buster of a wagon, <laughs> him and the ranger switching you know, to make it down to the train station, but by the time he makes it to the train station, he finds out McKinley's dead. Now an autopsy is performed right away. The bullet had passed through the stomach and then through the transverse colon and vanished through the peridoneum after penetrating a corner of the left kidney. There was also damage to the adrenal glands, glands and the pancreas. Done. Remember, like I said, the guy just poked around looking for the bullet, didn't even look at How the much other of damage. that damage is due to the jiggery pokery he was doing for the bullet? What a, yeah. Oh, how stupid. I know. You know, and well, of course, they didn't have the surgical techniques we do now. Right, and it's still but at he, the standard. even by those the standards then, mm -hmm. they could have operated. Well, there were some the interesting things that that was kind of blamed on hastening McKinley's death. First of all, he was nearly six years old and overweight. Okay. okay. Uh, the wound had never been cleaned. Remember, he just sewed up the accident. He never cleaned it. Stupid. And they never took any precautions against infections. Now, this is 1901. This isn't it. Yes, this isn't the have, Civil War. We have disinfectant. Yes. Up to this point, hey, yes. Louis Pasteur has made hoof, hoof and mouth disease a thing of the past. Right. You know. They had procedures in place oh. to combat infections, and they were totally ignored. See the stainless steel coated instruments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're a lot yeah. easier to keep clean <laughs> than these rusty old steel ones. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was watching that show recently where they're like, there's some emergency surgery going on, and the one guy's like, this isn't clean. And he's like, he's like, well, what do you expect? We're in... We're in a restaurant. Do you think they'd have sterile material here? Yeah, no kidding. I forgot what show it was, but yeah. They would, he goes, what would you rather him do? Get, get, you know, get an infection or die of the wound is basically, right. you know. But that's modern day where you can just pump somebody full of penicillin afterwards and clean it out. But Absolutely. Two days later, the grand jury is called and they agree oh, to yeah. try Shy Gloss for first degree murder. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, his lawyers were uh, court appointed. Yep. Oh, we will get into them in just a minute. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, September 19th, McKinley's funeral is held. And then on the 23rd, the trial starts. Now, here's interesting. The first stage in a trial is to call a jury. Mm -hmm. They call a jury and have the trial and the verdict all within two days. And the prosecution has all the evidence it needs. Right. 
And they call all these witnesses, but guess who they don't call? Big Jim. Big Jim. The man and the who... Secret Service, who were quoted, yeah. naming Parker by name. Yeah. Oh we, oh, we didn't see any Negro. Oh, you know, that's just... If you're not infuriated of the treatment of Parker right now, I don't know. I, I, it just infuriates me how this man even was treated 19, immediately. Even by 1901 standards. He was still a hero. Low. People were still treating him as a hero in many exactly. areas. But all Everybody of a sudden the government's like, Big oh, we're not Parker calling him. Yeah. For a witness. Mm -hmm. Oh, we, we didn't see him there. Wink, wink. Right. Or... You know. It seems to be like these elites mm -hmm. who are doing the denying. The right. specific people who can spin the narrative. The Associated and, but Press. The people, yeah. But the people in general love him. Right. The Associated Press would make sure they left him out of any uh -huh. articles. There they, you go. Any, even if he gave a direct interview, they would not. And they, if you remember, the Associated Press... What it does is it mm. gathers all that information and sends it out to newspapers. It doesn't do its own reporting. Oh, but it was editing the... Big Jim out at that don't point. Don't get me started on the Associated Press. Please. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's just go on to the next book. Now, like point. you said, uh, Scheigloss, uh <laughs> lawyers were court-appointed and very old. They literally wanted the trial to only be four hours a day and end <laughs> at a certain time so they could catch their train home. <laughs> they put that request in. <laughs> What a quite the motivated defense yeah. team. But then again, they were working with Shigloss, who wasn't giving them any help, so they had no witnesses, they had no evidence to support well, yeah, him. Well, yeah, he had to deal with this narcissist. Yeah, and it really mm -hmm. sounds like, yeah, these guys didn't really want to be there, but at the same token, they weren't given anything to work with either, so, you know. So two days later, on September 25th, after 30 minutes of deliberation, he is sentenced to death. Done. Okay. Yeah. Did he do it? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> September 27th, the African-American community in uh, Buffalo held a ceremony at the Vine Street African Methodist Church to honor Jim James Parker. And then the question of why he was not recognized uh, one, came up. One question mm -hmm. I want to ask about Jim Parker. Okay. Is, was he posthumously awarded anything? No. I I'd give him the uh, well one that one the highest honor that an administration can bestow upon a citizen would be uh, uh, the American Medal of Freedom. Yeah, I would. And I th I think maybe we should start a petition. I don't. There are groups that are trying to get him yeah. more recognized. There are, mm -hmm. and I think they should because I don't care who you are being treated like this after what he did is ridiculous. I mean this. The scattering at the church, that, that, was a, a, that was a valid question. Why wasn't he called to witness? Why is he being ignored? Mm -hmm. Is it just because he's black? Or is it one theory he was? Because the Secret Service feel like they because got Because he was up? first. He was first there, yes. To the assassin. Just because and, he happened to be standing the, behind him. And, and, and nobody in the DOJ got to the, the assassin first. It was this nobody. Right. I think that... that I think that the fact that he was he was black was just icing on the cake for some of these guys, right? Okay, who are in the elites, but the fact that he's a nobody, right, was the first order of business, right? He was, and they had to. He quash just got that. laid off from his uh -huh. catering job, right? He was unemployed, yeah, but he happened to be right there, and he happened to be mm -hmm. the quickest guy to react. You know, I, yeah, and the, and the fact that somebody and not one of their own got to the assassin yeah. first sticks in their craw. I think yeah. it's just personal. It's not about the money. Right. Well, on October 29th, Shigloss is executed in Auburn. Acid is poured in his casket <laughs> before he's buried in the mass grave in the Soul Cemetery. Oh, no, wait a minute. Yeah. That means... That the, 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 uh, other people's bodies are getting dumped on with acid, too. When well, it's a mass grave, grave. Oh, yeah. I think it's environmental consequences, but... Talk about sowing salt. We did actually grave. talk about going down to Seoul Cemetery on Sunday. Yes. To see if we could find his grave, and I said, oh, never mind, it's a mass just, grave. Just look for that dead spot in the grass. <laughs> That's where the acid is. <laughs> it's so brown, nothing grows. Now, now you're asking what happened to Jim afterwards, Jim Parker afterwards. Yeah. Oh, boy. Now we're going to get it to... Well, in December, Roosevelt invited him to the White House and did meet with him. So he, there was some recognition from the White House yeah. for what he did. 
Okay, and there was, and he was greeted by many officials, the ones who didn't feel like he should have been ignored. So Roosevelt was one of them. Uh, there were other ones. So it wasn't everybody. There wasn't this grand conspiracy by everyone in the government to block him out. Mm-hmm. But it definitely had, I think it, like you said, it, it may have to do with the Secret Service being upset that they hadn't got there quick enough. But, like I said, the man with, Jim Parker was right behind him. Right. Unless, he, you know. <laughs> And it wasn't like... Waiting to meet the president, yeah. like everybody else in the okay. line. And then he did make money for a while by doing lectures about what he had done that day. Uh-huh. And people would pay to come see him. So for a few years, he was doing okay. But then uh, in March 1907, he was found wandering in Philadelphia in a manic episode, basically. He was talking to himself. He, he was very incoherent. And... I got to give the Philadelphia Police Department this. Instead of locking him up thinking he was a drunk, they realized there was something physically wrong with him. And they took him to the hospital. Mm. And the hospital put him in a mental health wing because obviously something had happened mentally to him. Um, on April 13th that year, he died of heart disease. And this is where the real kick in the pants comes in. Ouch. Nobody claimed his body. And and when no, no family. No family, nobody. They didn't even really announce that he died at that point. And his body was handed over to one of the local university hospital teaching hospitals and it was dissected. That was the end of Big Jim. Well, where is he laid to rest then? Does anybody know? Somewhere in Philadelphia, I believe. I'm not sure. Uh, I could look it up real quick. But a year later, it was finally announced that he had died. And then people were like, a year you, later. like oh, you were uh, saying, where, where is he now? Where is he now? No, hmm. he, no, he was dissected and probably buried in a pulper grave. Probably. So, yeah, I mean. I, any, any photographs of Big Jim? Oh, yeah, there's a few online. If you go look okay. for, for Big Jim Parker, he was a big guy. Uh-huh. He was like 6'6", six, six, big dude, mm-hmm. you know. So those people say they didn't see the Negro. You didn't see the six foot tall, six and a half foot tall guy there. Are you blind? <laughs> didn't matter what. If he was black, white, you didn't Native see he was American, <laughs> didn't matter. He was big, <laughs> you know. And, and how uh, how tall did the assassin? Uh, oh, he was a tiny dude. <laughs> so they didn't see this, this six, giant, yeah, crushing this yeah. munchkin, yeah. <laughs> This short round. I know. You know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, it, oh uh, my goodness sakes! That that's just infuriating. But it is. The, it but is. But it's so typical. You know. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't know anything about Big Jim till I read that read up about this, and then as soon as I found out about him, I was like, how stinky, uh, yeah, horrible yeah. Uh-huh. that it, the rest of his life be the 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 mm-hmm. next six years of his life. Yes, he was able to give lectures. He was able to survive on that. But yeah, still, he was treated that way, you know? Well, it's nice that Roosevelt had him. Yes, that was a good gesture, yeah. You know, for a meeting yeah. so that he could you know, personally uh, extend his congratulations. Right. That, that was nice. That, that was, was really good. That yeah. Was really, uh, so, uh, that was upstanding proof, of, of President Roosevelt. That was proof that not everyone in the administration was like, mm-hmm. oh, we can't even mention Parker. No, Roosevelt's Absolutely. like, hey, come on over. Well, I want to meet you, you know? Well, you know, Roosevelt, you know, the old bull moose party mm-hmm. fella. <laughs> he's, uh, yeah, he's a, a pretty a pretty open with his discourse. Yeah. Pretty uh, speaking plainly, mm-hmm. you know, to the issues. And I bet he... And I think he, he probably was fed up. With the fact that the the press was ignoring him, and yeah, and so were official people, you know, about his involvement. And I bet Roosevelt was like, who else wouldn't have acted like that if they were in that same position? You know, I know. Go towards a guy with a gun. Yeah, yeah. Are you nuts? Exactly. They were probably you know, the Secret Service man would probably, no truth be known, holding back until the uh, assassin was out of bullets before springing into action. <laughs> I mean, put it if it wasn't way. Big Jim. <laughs> If it wasn't for Big Jim, yeah. Kinley probably would have died instantly that yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. Because if he would have unloaded all five of those bullets. Because he was he was aiming his third shot by yeah. the time uh, Big Jim made contact. Right. 
Now, you read about that gun. You know more about guns than me. That gun does fire pretty... I mean, it's not a semi-automatic or anything, but it is a revolver. It's a action. You can fire... You can just pull the trigger. Yeah. Yeah, so it would have been quick. As quick as you can. As quick as the mechanism will allow. So Big Jim literally tackles this dude probably Mm -hmm. as soon as he heard the first one and just happened to reach him after the second bullet was fired. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're saying that's how fast it happened... And the Secret Service, who have been watching everybody, mm-hmm. of course they're not focused on one guy. Big no. Jim happened to be focused on this guy because he was in front of him. <laughs> you know? It happened to be. Right. Uh, so, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I think I think Big Jim Parker deserves, he deserves you know, a posthumous yeah. award of uh, the highest. The, the um, American Medal of Freedom uh, will only do. Yeah, like I said, there are people who are trying to, you know, rectify that. It's, there's right. a group in Buffalo who are really working to try to rectify that, make sure that people know about Big Jim and trying to get his, his name out there. I don't know if there's anything going on in Atlanta where he was from, if he's maybe a little more well-known down there, you know, mm-hmm. as a hero. I would like to find out about that. Yeah, he really deserves... a a lot more, and he deserves to be mentioned more. Absolutely. I didn't know much about McKinley's uh, death. I knew he'd been killed by an anarchist in Buffalo, and then I started researching this. And really, the first few articles I read didn't mention Parker at all. Wow. He was totally glossed over, just that a bystander tackled. And then when I finally got to who this bystander was, I was like, oh. you know. Yeah, even in your, uh, even in the course yeah. of your research, yeah, you found uh, the the mention of yeah. the, the the facts, you know, mm-hmm. a little bit of you know, the source was being a little recalcitrant right. with the, in their reporting as to who it was. Right. And so. they, perhaps they didn't even have, uh, well, I don't know, uh, I accuse them of, of recalcitrance, mm-hmm. but that's <laughs> kind of a, a nefarious thing. But it, maybe their facts weren't even you know complete. Right. But the, subject. but the more and I dug so, into it, the more, I mean, and then I finally found his name and yeah, and I dug into Jim and it, wow, you know, he was a hero at the time. And mm-hmm. You know what? If anyone deserves a movie made, even though it ends tragically, and I, I think this, this man's needs to be, story needs to be told. Yeah. Who'd you get to play him? I mean, six foot six, <laughs> big dude. Oh, we can't name any names on this. Podcast. Okay. <laughs> For copyright reasons. Okay. Anybody who's listening to this, and you can respond to any of the podcasters or on their YouTube channel or whatever, <laughs> who would you get to play Big Jim? <laughs> okay. Jim. Anyway, I think we should... Co- oh, wow. We almost talked for an hour. Uh, oh, so terrific. I think uh, that will do it. So if you're okay, ever in well, Buffalo, you can go see the replica of the gun that shot McKinley. You think uh, the spirit of McKinley haunts the gun? That's why they don't bring it out? I would be more thinking he would probably haunt the... House yeah. that he had stayed at, because that's where he died. Gun. Yeah. yeah. Spirit guns have known to exist. I know. <laughs> no, but I think it's more likely he's haunting the house where he died. The haunt. <laughs> if he's haunting any place. Yeah. Okay. All right. There's the supernatural element there for you. <laughs> Real quick at the end. Just so I can say thank you for listening to our ghastly podcast. Bye. Thank you for listening to Unearthly Upstate. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Patreon, and our webpage. We are also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Sprecher, Stitcher, Podbean, Google Podcasts, and CastBox. Please like, share, and view on your favorite platform. Unearthly Upstate is an animator liner production. The show is produced by Mari and Matt Manette, with purring provided by Honey and Lloyd. Research and writing by Mari Manette. Music is by Kevin McCloud, licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Unless otherwise stated in the episode, the places mentioned in the broadcast are not paid or contact us for any type of promotion. Please check out our webpage for credit and sources for the episode. Thank you.